Hi everybody, welcome back, and if you're new, welcome. My name is Gabby, and if you've never been here before, never watched any of my videos, have no idea what I do here on my channel, I cover true crime cases, and all the cases that I cover are a little bit older, they're all basically 20 years or older, so if that's something that you might be interested in, maybe go down below, click that subscribe button, and make sure to turn on the post notifications to be notified every time that I upload. So. Today's video is in collaboration with someone I have worked with a few times before. I wanna say like three or four times, somebody that I love working with every time we collaborate. And that is Anthony who runs the true crime blog, Crime Blogger 1983. I will have his blog and Facebook linked down below in the description of this video if you all wanna check out his page and just after this video, maybe dive into some write-ups done on a variety of different cases. He reached out to me asking me if I wanted to cover a missing persons case he did some extensive research on and wanted some more coverage for it and I was all for it. He also helped me with my script write-up for this video, which I greatly appreciate. So so with all of that being said, let's get right into the case. This is the disappearance of Gayla Shaper. Gayla Christine Nelson entered the world on the first day of May in the year 1951 in the charming city of Moscow, Idaho. Her proud parents, Laverne C. Nelson and Connie Michelson Nelson, were also blessed with two sons, Grant and Greg, as well as another daughter, Gloria. I do want to say quickly that with every single case that I cover here on my channel, I designate a bit of time to looking up how to pronounce things properly, whether that be different names of cities, towns, counties, countries, or simply last names. From everything that I read online, locals refer to the area as Moscow, not Moscow. I just wanna make that clear because I know that some people may be a bit confused on the way that I'm pronouncing it. I do wanna highlight the area of Moscow, Idaho though, before I dive into the case. Moscow has been named one of the 100 best art towns in America. It's known as the heart of arts. It is home to the Festival Dance Academy, the Lionel Hampton Jazz Festival. They have a beautiful art gallery. They have the summer arts festival called a rendezvous in the park and also the Moscow Renaissance Fair. It is also though home to the University of Idaho, which is the town's principal employer. Now when you heard Moscow, Idaho, you may have thought, where have I heard of this area before if it didn't initially come to you? But there was a couple years ago a tragedy that occurred to four University of Idaho students. When it comes to true crime, this is definitely something in recent years that has been front and center when it comes to news reports. During the early hours of Sunday, November 13th of 2022, Ethan Chapin, Madison Mogan, Kaylee Gonzalez, and Zana Kernodal were brutally murdered in their off-campus residence. Brian Koberger, a PhD student at Washington State University, has been charged with the murders and a trial currently awaits. It's an absolutely uncalled for and devastating ruthless crime that took place in this area two years ago, but this area overall has been regarded as being safe. That does not mean that crime has never taken place there before though. There's actually another case, a murder case that I'm currently looking into. I'm trying to get information sent over to me about but just because crime has taken place there, it's very rare. Today, Moscow, its population is roughly 25,000, but back when this case and discussion took place, it was home to somewhere in the neighborhood of 16,000. Let's get into the actual case, though, of Gayla Shaper. Gayla had attended Moscow High School from the years of 1965 to 1969, and while there, she participated in the Future Teachers of America and the American Field Service programs. The Future Teachers of America is a program that, quote, encourages young people to choose teaching as a career and provides a means for students to participate in realistic education-based activities. And the American Field Service Programs is another program that, quote, enables responsible citizens to come together as a group and work on spreading the concept of peace and diversity across the world and to help others understand that peace is constantly threatened by injustice, inequality, and intolerance. I highlight her involvement in these two groups because it really shows the career path that she may have wanted to take at one time in her life and the type of caring individual that Gayla was. After graduating from Moscow High School in 1969, Gayla started working at Gregson's Shoe Store. Within a few years, Gayla had met a man she fell in love with, and he asked her to be his wife in 1972 when Gayla was 21 years old. His name was Ken Shaper, and he owned Sam's Dairy, a local dairy farm in Moscow. On August 11, 1972, Gayla became Gayla Shaper. 
At this point, everything seemed to be looking up for the newlyweds. Sam's Dairy was later renamed Dutch Boy Dairy and it became the primary supplier for whole milk in Moscow and some of the surrounding areas. But the fairy tale, unfortunately, would come to a sudden and dreadful end seven years after they married. On Friday, June 29th of 1979, Ken dropped his 28-year-old wife off at a pasture along Lenville Road to feed her two horses. Ken planned to take the car into town to get it washed. He was to return within the hour. Gayla was either going to walk back to their home or possibly go to her parents' home. The time between Ken dropping her off at the pasture and him making it back was approximately 45 minutes. I would like to note that there is no official time in the news reports when it comes to the exact time when Ken dropped Gayla off, but some online sources say that it was around 7 p.m. Most news reports at the time simply claim that it was late evening. Ken noted that on this day when he dropped her off, she had been wearing a blue sweater over a gold v-neck top, Levi's jeans, and sneakers. He went home, she wasn't there, and he went back to the pasture and Gayla was nowhere to be found. Ken did not immediately grow concerned. He figured that maybe she went to her parents' home. Maybe she started walking to her parents' home or possibly Gayla's father had stopped by the pasture and picked her up. Gayla's parents lived in Woodland Hills, which was about two to three miles away. Ken was surprised to find out that when he got to her parents' home, they had not seen her. Ken and Gayla's parents spent hours searching the pasture and dairy farm in an attempt to find her or any clues pointing to where she could have gone they found nothing. The Leda County Sheriff's Office was notified around midnight that night that a local woman was missing, and Ken filed a missing persons report for his wife immediately. An extensive search of the area ensued, not only in the area of the pasture where Ken dropped Gayla off, but all over Moscow. The investigation eventually included 20 law enforcement agencies. However, despite this, the investigation into Gayla's disappearance would eventually turn cold. There were no sightings of Gayla anywhere in Moscow, much less anywhere else, nor had Gayla called anyone she knew. No friends or family stated they received any phone calls from her since she had strangely vanished. I will note that there was an early lead according to newspaper accounts that stated authorities feared Gayla may have been kidnapped and taken to Montana, but there was no elaboration on why they may have thought this at the time. I'm guessing it was just a random tip. As with most missing persons investigations, after the search for the person fails, the investigation usually goes back to the person who reported them missing or the last person to have seen them. Authorities started investigating Ken. By July of 1980, the sheriff at the time, Mike Getz, felt his investigation was hindered because he was unable to get permission to use certain tools to investigate specific people. The tools being polygraph, truth serum, and even hypnosis, which over the years have proven unreliable, but back during this time were considered valuable in terms of obtaining information. For a large part of this investigation, there were really two main theories police had when it came to this case, and that was one, Ken had done something to his wife, and two, someone had abducted her. The pasture where Gayla kept her horses was adjacent to State Highway 8. Could someone have been driving down the highway, spotted her alone, forced her into their vehicle, and drove off? That was a possibility in their eyes, and one theory that is still heavily considered today. Law enforcement did ask Ken if the couple had any odd occurrences or anything peculiar happened to them in the weeks or months leading up to Gayla's disappearance. Ken is on record stating, Someone is trying to get us, and I don't know who. When pressed, Ken informed authorities of an occurrence that happened in the home on the regular during the months prior. Reports do not go into detail regarding what he said was being said in the calls or if anything was said at all, but these calls were coming on the regular. He also said that these calls were happening during all hours of the night and he did not know who was on the other side. He had no idea who it could have been. Ken also went on to tell them of something that sounds almost like it's right out of a thriller movie, which if this definitely happened, then that is probably where the individual who did it got the idea from. On April 13th of 1979, which was Good Friday, the couple received a letter that read, you sold out to Satan. 
The letter was made up from letters that were cut from newspapers and magazines. The purpose of this letter and the meaning behind it is still a mystery, and whether or not it's related to Gayla's disappearance is also unclear. No further information has ever been provided regarding the letter, and I'm uncertain if police ever saw the letter themselves or not. That was everything there was to inform authorities of that took place before Gayla disappeared, but there was something that took place after. Roughly two months after Gayla's disappearance, in August of 1979, Gayla's mother, Connie, received two calls from a woman she said sounded exactly like her daughter. This woman stated that she needed help and the calls would end abruptly. After this occurred, law enforcement installed a tape recorder at the residence in the hopes that if the person called again, they would be able to record it. However, no further calls came in. Most do believe that these calls were simply prank calls, but you can never be certain. They couldn't explain the phone calls. Could it have just been somebody in the area, a very heartless, disgusting person who finds enjoyment out of other people's sorrows, who decided to look up the family name in the phone book and give them a call pretending to be their missing daughter? We don't know this could have been what happened and this wouldn't have been the first time. Overall though, her loved ones knew that she would have never just up and left her life behind. As Leda County Sheriff Sergeant Brandon Jordan would tell the Lewiston Tribune during an interview in 2008, she was involved with the church. She had a stable home life. There's nothing in her personality to indicate she was unstable or anything like that. When people disappear like that, there's usually something traumatic going on in their life and their friends know about it. As we know, that is not always the case. Sometimes there are things going on in your head that you don't tell the people around you, but the people who knew her best stated that they knew of nothing that was troubling her, nothing that would have forced her to want to just leave her entire life behind, nothing that made her afraid to go home, nothing like that. Some people did believe the theory that maybe she used feeding her horses as an excuse to have time to skip town, start a new life somewhere else. The people though who knew her best, like I said, did not believe this for a second. Gayla didn't take anything with her and she would have never left her family, husband, and friends worried sick about her. They knew that something had to have happened to her and that she may have not been alive anymore to tell of what actually happened that evening in the pasture. Gayla's case though at this time was at a standstill. Authorities had conducted over a hundred interviews, even eventually being granted permission to administer polygraph tests. Nothing was getting them any closer though to discovering what happened to Gayla. In March of 1980, the Leda County Sheriff's Office spoke to a psychic they deemed trustworthy. Her name was Dorothy Allison and she was out of New Jersey. She had worked with law enforcement previously and she agreed to work with Leda law enforcement for Gayla's case. Sheriff Mike Getz looked into everything she told them during these hours of speaking, but unfortunately they were unable to uncover anything new regarding Gayla's case. There were really no new updates in this case until 1993. This is when the case was officially reopened. New information would come to light that I will get into momentarily, but I wanna highlight the fact that Gayla's husband, Ken, was targeted for many years by authorities and the public because of course, when an individual goes missing or is murdered, the person most often looked at is their significant other. He was also the last person to have seen her. Ken volunteered though at this time to do a polygraph test, he passed, and was officially eliminated as a suspect. Ken was quoted saying, I just want this to be left alone and go on with my life. Ken had a very hard time dealing with the scrutiny surrounding Gayla's disappearance while living in Moscow. It is worth noting that the Leda County Sheriff's Office did end up apologizing to Ken for everything he went through. What is the new incident though that put a spark back into this case? Well, on the night of October 26th, 1993, in an incident that was seemingly unrelated to Gayla's disappearance, Moscow resident William Gale Hagedorn was heavily drinking and got into a heated argument with his live-in girlfriend, Joanne Grace Romero. The argument was said to have gone on for about four hours and it escalated into William taking his 38 caliber handgun and shooting Joanne in her side. Despite an ambulance being immediately dispatched and her being taken to a local hospital, 
Joanne died from her injuries. William tried telling authorities that Joanne getting shot was a complete accident, but that didn't help. I would like to point out though that according to all accounts, William and Joanne's relationship was described as being an abusive one. William was later convicted of Joanne's murder. I'm sure you might be asking yourself, well, what does this have to do with Gayla's disappearance? Not long after Joanne's death, Joanne's family contacted law enforcement and told them that they believed Joanne was murdered as a result of her knowing what, and I quote, Larry, William's father, and William did to a woman inside a metal shop in 1979. Naturally, this piqued law enforcement's interest, so they decided to question William, who was already in custody. Upon questioning him, William was reported to have cried and said, I don't want to hurt my dad. Then he kind of just shut down and wouldn't talk anymore. William was found guilty of murdering Joanne Romero and was sentenced to life in prison. Even with William refusing to talk though, an anonymous source came forward and confirmed the information Joanne's family told law enforcement regarding Gayla. As a result of this, law enforcement began investigating Larry Hagedorn, which was William's father. Law enforcement took little time in obtaining a search warrant for Larry's property. Larry Hagedorn actually owned a property that Gayla's horses grazed on, and he lived right across the street from where she went missing. I would also like to point out that he owned an excavation business and a part of this excavation business, he did own a backhoe. With the knowledge of his business, the statements made by Larry's son, the claims of Joanne's family, as well as the claims made by the anonymous source, authorities obtained a warrant and brought in excavation equipment to begin digging up the ground of Hagedorn's property. They also at this time brought in cadaver dogs to sniff around the property and see if they picked up on Gayla's scent. The property was searched twice, once in February of 1994 and again in July of 1995 when more information came into the sheriff's office telling them about Larry and William's suspected involvement in Gayla's disappearance. In the first search of Hagedorn's property, authorities uncovered a firearm. Larry Hagedorn was a convicted felon as a result of being convicted of statutory rape 40 years prior in Washington state. Larry was arrested soon thereafter for the firearm violation. He posted a $1,000 bail and a court date was set. If convicted, he faced up to five years in prison. I did a lot of digging online and I could not discover if he had been convicted for this or not. As a result of both searches, two bone fragments were uncovered in an area where two cadaver dogs kind of picked up on some and a couple pieces of clothing wrapped in a curtain and tennis shoes were also uncovered that were similar to what Gayla was wearing when she disappeared. These bone fragments were sent for further testing and never really mentioned again, so it is assumed that they were bones that belonged to an animal, not human. Regarding the clothing, Sergeant Brandon Jordan told the Lewiston Tribune, we did unearth some clothing that was wrapped in a curtain and some tennis shoes, a blouse, and things like that. We actually sent that to a crime lab and FBI in Quantico, Virginia, but nothing ever came back that was substantial evidence. In that same interview, he goes on to say, we sent the case in 2001 to some cold case detectives in California to an agency down there that has a cold case bureau, and they reviewed the case and had it for several weeks. And then they forwarded the case back with a synopsis that was basically pretty much what we thought. Some people have theorized that possibly Gayla was abducted and murdered by a serial killer that was just drifting through the area. And to that, Sergeant Brandon Jordan says, I know that we had at the time some high profile serial killers that rolled through the area, like the Green River Killer. We called and checked on a few other killers who'd been arrested and were now in prison. We'd ask those detectives, where was your guy at about this time? At the end of the day, no known serial killers have ever been tied to Gayla's disappearance. Still to this day, Gayla's remains and nothing of hers has ever been located and she is still considered a missing person. Larry Hagedorn passed away in 2005. I think it's worth noting that he was given a polygraph test at some point, and according to the sheriff's office, he passed. Despite this, he remains law enforcement's main person of interest, and his son William, still after all these years, refuses to talk. She's still considered a missing person officially, said Detective Earl Aston of the Leda County Sheriff's Office, but it's presumed she was 
murdered. Sergeant Brandon Jordan stated that he believes she was abducted from the pasture and the motive was sexual. He was quoted saying in the same Lewiston Tribune interview that I referenced before, I talked to a family member of Joanne Ramirez and she told me that Larry had done it. We had reason to believe at the time that Larry was our person of interest. He lived right across the street from where she disappeared. He owned an excavation business. He owned a backhoe and he was doing a lot of excavating on the property, burying trash. At one time, he buried a car. At the time, Larry's attorney told reporters that his client was simply being railroaded by a young detective who was trying to make a name for himself in the department by solving a cold case, that he had no involvement in the disappearance of Gayla Shaver. Neither Larry nor his son, William, have ever been charged in relation to the disappearance of Gayla Shaper. But what happened to some of the others that I mentioned during this video? Dutch Boy Dairy eventually folded due to the state of Idaho requiring automation to be used in farming. Ken eventually got remarried, started a family, and ended up working for Idaho State University. Gayla's father, Laverne, passed away in 2016. Gayla's mother, Connie, from my understanding, is still alive and still hoping to one day find out what happened to her daughter. Gayla Shaper was 28 years old when she went missing from Moscow, Idaho in 1979. She had blue eyes and blonde hair. She was 5 feet 8 inches tall and weighed 135 pounds. She was last seen wearing blue Levi's jeans, a gold v-neck top, a blue sweater, and sneakers. If you have any information regarding the case of Gayla Shaper, you are urged to contact the Leda County Sheriff's Office at 208-882-2216. Information is quite limited when it comes to what Joanne's family had to say regarding what they possibly knew he had done to her. Obviously without legitimate proof that he did do it, I can't sit here online even all these years later and say that he for certain did. But anyone looking into this case, anyone hearing about this information, you are going to obviously think, well, if William knew that his father had absolutely no involvement in the disappearance and suspected murder of a local woman, wouldn't he have just immediately been shocked and told authorities that his father had no involvement? Instead, he starts freaking out a little bit, breaks down, cries, and says, I don't wanna hurt my dad. To me, in my opinion, it doesn't seem like it is fear-based that that is the reason that William is not saying anything because Larry has been deceased since 2005. It seems like overall, if William does know more regarding Gayla's disappearance, that it is just some undying loyalty to his dad. According to inmateaid.com, William Gale Hagedorn is still alive today. He is serving time at Idaho Correctional Center and he is currently 62 years old. I understand the phrase, blood is thicker than water, to stick beside your family, but to protect a family member when you know that they were a cold-blooded killer and to not give some sort of peace to another family is one of the most heartless things that anyone can do. But that is all that I have to say in today's video regarding the disappearance of Gayla Shaper. Thank you all for taking a little bit of time out of your day to hear about her case. And thank you, Anthony, again, for even just bringing her case to my attention. I hope you all have an amazing rest of your day. Stay safe, and I will see you in the next one.